right? This is chapter 13. This is human impact on the marine ecosystems. All right, our vocab is bioaccumulation, global warming, eutrophication, biomagnification, also can be for, um, sorry, never mind, you have it on number one, <laughs> greenhouse effect and coral bleaching. Um, so the topics we're gonna look at, and I've also gone through some of these in some of the classes through the study guide, um, the oil industry, and we just finished that documentary today, desalination plants, agriculture, sewage and refuse or other pollution, dredging, bioaccumulation, um, global warming, and then using wrecked ships for diving sites. Um, so the oil industry, so we can extract gasoline, diesel, kerosene, and butamine. Um, it's obtained by drilling at land or at sea because <coughs> um, it's created through fossil fuel production, uh, which takes millions and millions of years to produce, but it's um, organic material from fossilized organisms. Um, using offshore platforms, uh, the oil reserves, the ships need to map the seafloor. They can do this by emitting high explosive impulses so they can look at what's underneath the seafloor. Uh, the noise could kill fish eggs. Um, the sound waves could fill, kill fish eggs. Their larvae uh, could damage fish vibration detection. Um, damaged fish are obviously less able to escape, escape predators so and find mates so that they're going to die and the lack of mating is going to decrease their populations. Whales and other fish um, will get diverted from different migratory routes. Drilling in the seabed will release toxins uh, like benzene and zinc and arsenic, and those can pass through the food web and bioaccumulate. Um, bioaccumulation is the accumulation of toxins like pesticides or other chemicals in an organism, and then it magnifies up the trophic levels. Drilling can disrupt sediment. Let's hide that. Drilling can disrupt sediment. Um, this could block uh, the the gills of fish, it could block coral polyps, uh, it can block light, and that's gonna decrease light penetration, it's gonna decrease photosynthesis, decrease primary productivity, and therefore have less organic matter for your trophic levels. The seabed will physically become damaged and organisms that are living in it will be dislodged or killed. All right, um, so the toxicity and physical damage that oil can do uh, it can ca is caused from leaking from oil tankers or drilling sites, really large amounts of oil are released into the ocean. It's costly both financially and environmentally. Um, oil toxicity, crude oil has many toxic components when it's ingested by marine animals. Whales and dolphins will come to the surface to breathe and it's gonna coat their lungs. It's gonna get stuck in their blowholes. It could cause suffocation. Uh, it can get in their eyes, of course. Uh, prevent turtle hatchings from surfacing to breathe. Pelagic fish, so I um, shouldn't say REM ventilation, just say RAM ventilation. But fish that swim in the pelagic area, the middle water column that do ram ventilation, will take oil into their mouths. Um, they'll also get it into their gills. Uh, seabirds will get it on their wings. It will cause them not be able to fly, not be able to cause, not be able to allow them to be as buoyant. So they'll start to sink and drown. It can mess up with their insulation and cause hypothermia or drowning because it mats the feathers down and then it doesn't cover their skin effectively anymore. And so they are susceptible to really. Um, extreme temperature changes then. Um, animals that are furred like seals, it'll impede their insulation and they can have death by hypothermia. The effect on food webs and ecosystems, oil on the surface will reduce light penetration, uh, phytoplankton and photosynthesis will decrease, toxins can build up in higher trophic levels and biomagnify disrupting your food webs. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> specifically damaging coastal ecosystems. <clears throat> um, currents can move the oil to different beach areas into the coastline. Poisons can suffocate coastal organisms and mangroves. Uh, mangrove roots can prevent coastal erosion by anchoring down the soil. So this is, again, like why we need mangroves and having oil damaging it, why that's, um, why that's poor. Um, we know mangroves are nurseries for fish. Um, they're nesting areas for birds and, um, and yeah, just all around a good nursery area for all types of organisms, and they have really high biodiversity. Oil can get on rock and sand, um, so seaweed and crabs and enemies, they end up being killed too because they are a organism that lives on a rocky substrate. The oil can solidify from the sun. Um, the wind could also cause it to solidify and it can settle into deeper sand layers where it can remain for a really long period of time. It could damage seabirds and turtle nesting sites, and it'll take a really long time to recover from the population loss. 
damage caused by cleaning it up. So the oil does not dissolve in water, so it's going to become slick across the surface. Some of the cleanup methods are more damaging. You could burn the oil. To do that, we need calm winds, and many times it doesn't happen offshore, but it'll produce a lot of smoke. It'll produce um, sulfur dioxide, which contributes to acid rain. Dispersants, we use those. We saw that in the documentary. They're sprayed onto the spill to break it up into smaller droplets. Um, this helps with coastline contamination, but it's not going to remove it, right? It's not going to go anywhere. It's just in smaller pieces. Corexit is a common dispersant, and it's very toxic to plankton. Corexit will accumulate in your top predators, and the oil particles will sink to the seabed, and your filter feeders are going to digest it. And um, oh, not just your filter feeders, but your detritivores, um, you know, your crabs and lobsters and shrimp and organisms that eat detritus or decaying material and break it into smaller pieces. And then we know things that are on the seabed are really influential in terms of upwelling. This could create oxygen dead zones. The oil is going to um, sink. Anaerobic bacteria, so anaerobic doesn't need oxygen, can use it as an energy source. Um, lots of oil, therefore we're going to have lots of bacteria breaking it down. If there's lots of bacteria breaking it down, they're going to do cellular respiration a lot. Um, high respiration is going to decrease oxygen concentrations, and this will create a dead zone or hypoxic area. I think the talking is causing the yawning. Um, indirect effects of the oil industry. When it's burnt, the oil is going to emit many gases, again, sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide. CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and obviously it's going to help um, lead to or help encourage ocean acidification because um, carbon dioxide dissolves into the ocean layers, creates carbonic acid. Um, it also contributes to global warming. It's a greenhouse gas. Global warming is the observed and projected increase in average temperatures of Earth's surface, or I'm sorry, Earth's atmosphere and their oceans due to an enhanced greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect is the that certain gases are able to hold on to infrared or like the warm radiation given off by the sun causes global warming. Sulfur dioxide will get dissolved in rainwater. Uh, it creates sulfuric acid, and then you have acid rain. On land, this can destroy trees and freshwater fish. In the ocean, it'll decrease the pH, and obviously this can affect shell production. All right, desalination plants. So to desalinate is to remove salt from water. But we have human population increasing, so there's a really high demand for water. Um, not just for our own drinking purposes, but for agriculture purposes, um, for our lifestyles. So golf courses, um, pools, uh, water parks, resorts, we need to extract fresh water from the seawater by removing the salt. So to do this, you can do distillation. So to distill the water, you're going to boil the seawater and only H2O is going to boil out. So the water that condenses at the top of a screen will be collected. Huh. And just again, just that water is fresh. And then the salt gets left behind. Or we can do reverse osmosis and pump water really high pressure through membranes that and the membranes will extract out water and leave back the salt. Both can cause really high pollutants and effluents. High salinity brine. Brine is going to be very concentrated salt, um, solid, salt compound. Um, really high salinity brine will get released into waters, and this is at like a desalination plant. The salt has to go somewhere, so it gets put back into the water. Um, it's really hot. The density is high because you have a lot of particles per area, so it'll sink to the bottom. This will increase the salinity of the water. It'll cause death in osmoconformers, so organisms that become like the salinity because the salinity is like abnormally high. Even your osmo regulators will die. They're just not going to be able to do active transport at the rate that it needs to happen. Um, despite them, you know, actively drinking and taking in water, your osmo regulators, the water is of a way higher salinity, um, more than a hyper saline water would be, and that's going to cause death to them as well. Productivity is lower in higher salinities. There's less food in the ecosystem. There's less dissolved oxygen in um, higher salinities, so that could cause suffocation. And it can affect water currents because 
the natural halo cline and you know um split of different salt concentrations in the ocean that'll be changed and so that could affect water currents and where the water is flowing pollution due to chemical waste chlorine is added to desalination plants to stop algae growth in the machinery the chlorine is toxic to sea creatures heavy metals like copper iron nickel chromium are leaked into the water from these machines they're going to sink to the seabed again taken in by filter feeders and then they can accumulate near top predators these are cleaned every three to six months and they release many harsh toxins when that happens so the effects of desalination um, the outflow of water when the water is coming out of the desalination plant it can dislodge sediment cause turbidity and then therefore decrease light penetration um, they could have a direct risk to organisms so aside from the water pollution that we have the pollution due to chemical waste on this slide Aside from that, um, some organisms can get sucked into the water pumps that go into the desalination plants. Filters are used to stop organisms from getting sucked in. However, planktonic organisms, so your free floaters, um, larvae, and eggs will still get caught. Ugh. Okay, effects from agriculture. Uh, we've talked about this heavily in this class. Fertilizers that have nitrogen and phosphorus in your coastal areas can cause algal blooms because it's an, an excess nutrient. Um, they need phosphorus and nitrogen to do um, protein synthesis, to make proteins, um, amino acids, and to make, um, I want to say nitrogenous bases, but to make nucleic acids so they can make DNA. Algal blooms can also cause dead zones and no life can live there. This is called eutrophication. So where you're going to have a lot of limiting nutrients, your algae go crazy taking it up, um, they deplete the nutrients, algae sink and die, and then the microscopic organisms, your decomposers at the bottom, are going to break down the dead algae using all the oxygen that's available, and then no more producers, no more oxygen, and everything essentially gets dead for a while. Animal feces and plant material can also cause oxygen depletion, same reason. Um, pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides can get in the water as well that are used in agriculture. It could poison animals and accumulate in top predators. Excuse me. Okay. The process of agriculture, or the process of eutrophication, rather, because of agriculture. Fertilizers will get leached into rivers and rainwater. Remember, it's when the water is, like, stealing nutrients. The rivers can develop high amounts of mineral ions that's carried to estuaries in the seas, like um, nitrogen and phosphorus. It can cause planktonic overgrowth or an algal bloom. The algae will all compete for sunlight um, and use all the resources. They will die and sink. Bacteria decompose the algae at a really fast rate, using up oxygen to do so. There's really low oxygen because of the death of these organisms. This is where we live. This is our coastline right here. This is our river. <coughs> Excuse me. Sewage and refuse. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, refuse is water with waste. This is typically coming from pipes, or I'm sorry, sewage. Water with waste, um, typically coming from pipes and underground sewers. There's four types of sewage. There's domestic sewage that's generated from residences, hospitals, and schools. It goes to underground sewers. Surface, um, that's going to be rain that's going to run over a surface of the ground and then take up particles from there. Industrial waste is from factories. It can be treated before going into a sewage system. And there's a lot of detergents, heavy metals, and pesticides in that. And then untreated sewage is um, just raw fecal material, raw sewage. <laughs> you know what this is. <laughs> um, fecal matter, organic waste, are a food source for decomposing bacteria. And they have effects really similar to agricultural runoff, so this eutrophication situation. But instead of it being fertilizers, it's going to be sewage and fecal material. And fecal material is an organic compound. And it has um, a lot of nutrients in it, but too much nutrients. Um, detergents will contain surfactants, and that break da breaks down the surface tension. Soaps break down the hydrogen bonding, and it makes water like more wet or more slippery. So water is not sticking to itself. You can get water breaking apart and like disperse, so it can get into smaller crevices. So d detergents like a soap, um, they have surfactants. They'll break down surface tension between water molecules. Um, it can help break down the mucus layer on fish 
And we saw that happening at the end of the documentary, and that was caused by all of the dispersants that were used from the core exit. Birth control pills or any kind of hormonal contraceptive steroids um, make their way into the water as well if they are flushed down a toilet or in a sink. Um, and, you know, we get some particles that come from landfills, but not like if we flush things down the toilet. Human gastrointestinal viruses can also enter the water and harm animals. Mainly mammals will get affected by our gastrointestinal viruses. Okay, so this is actually pretty cool. Um, refuse is composed of discarded items from ships or coastal areas. So just like trash pollutants. Uh, there's an estimated annually 10,000 shipping containers that are lost due to storms. The majority of refuse is plastic, which is poor because it's not biodegradable. It's going to stay in the environment. Um, not if Khalil has anything to do with it. That's funny. So I wrote this last year, and Khalil Valson was going to Stetson, and I don't think he's going to Stetson right now. But when he told me this, he was going to study at Stetson. Um, was he at FAMU? I don't remember. But he wanted to look at, he wanted to study chemistry, and um, he wanted to look at how we could break down the great garbage patch that floats in the Pacific Ocean. Um, waves and ultraviolet light can break down these plastics into microparticles, where they're going to float on the surface um, and get really concentrated. They can also be taken in through filter feeders. Um, a computer screen has been seen before in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It takes about four years for trash in North America to reach the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in one year if it's coming from Asia. Um, in 1992, a cargo ship leaving Japan lost cargo of toy rubber ducks. They've been found all over the world. They're referred to as the friendly floaties. Um, their pathways can help us actually study ocean currents. And this really does follow thermohaline circulation, which I believe is a chapter six topic. It's pretty funny, though. They find them everywhere. Okay, this is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. A little Vimeo video on it. And they all converge right here. Okay, trash and wildlife. Seabirds, turtles, fish, mammals, they get will get entangled in fishing line and nets. It could cause them to drown or not um, cause them to not be able to move away as fast, be really susceptible to predation. Animals could get punctured by trash that they're eating. Um, I think we all know living here, um, sea turtles eat straws and it'll get stuck in their throat, stuck in their nose. Um, a lot of sea turtles will feed on jellyfish and a plastic bag looks a lot like a jellyfish. So they will consume the bag and then um, get it clogged in their gastrointestinal tract or they'll just suffocate from it. Um, again, the trash can pile up in their digestive tract and die. Plastics can release toxins, um, by our bisphenols, biphenols, whatever. Um, and this can encourage the animal to absorb the toxins when it's broken down into smaller pieces. PCBs will accumulate up the food chain. Plastic particles can block light penetration and decrease productivity. Dredging. So this is physically taking sediment from bottom or shallow areas in the water um, and then adding it to the beach. So this is used to take minerals from sand. Um, it's used to like deepen canals. Like we need to dredge, we need to dredge the um, Port Canaveral canals so that those huge ships can come in. Um, we also dredge and we can see them offshore so that we can widen the beaches. So there's three methods. We could do suction dredging. A really strong vacuum will suck up sand and deposit it to like a nearby tank. Like imagine like a big empty um, garbage truck, but it's a boat floating next to this big dredging machine. And it sucks out the sand and then it's going to input it in the other tank. I don't know if there's a picture of it. Like this. Filling it in the tank. Um, many have cutting equipment to break down any hard rock. Mechanical dredging, you literally drag buckets on the bottom of the seabed and scrape up sediment. The buckets are on a rotating belt. Buckets are on a rotating belt, and as they suck up the sand, they're going to just move up, get dumped into the, um, into the boat, and then move back down, pick up more, move up, get dumped into the boat, and then it continues like a cycle.
Or we have water injection dredging. Ships use really, really long um, and large with really high pressure hose pipe, and it physically forces um, water out at the sediment with, uh, or the water that comes out forces sediment out with really high pressure. It'll cause any kind of dislodged or really um, compacted sediment to be able to be lifted and then make ways for large ships. Literally with water pressure, just pushing the sediment out of the way. So the physical damage that it does to benthic communities, remember benthic is bottom, um, the seabed gets removed, so therefore you're going to be breaking coral or any kind of like sessile organisms that don't move, clams or mussels, like they can't get out of the way of it. So any organism that is sessile or attached to the substrate is going to be um, affected. Breeding grounds could be affected. Your bottom feeders, um, bottom filter feeders, and the entire food web that feeds off them will be affected. Um, can take years to recover from it. Uh, other effects of dredging, sediment release. So we know that can stir up. If there's sediment being released, it's going to increase turbidity. It's going to decrease light penetration. Therefore, you're not going to have as much photosynthesis. Um, organic material is going to decrease because you're not doing primary productivity. <coughs> Um, stirring up sediment could some other polyps. It could get in the gill filaments of fish. Um, it could cover sediment organisms whenever the sediment starts to settle. Sessile organisms that can't move, the sediment can cover that. It could damage sperm and eggs that are in the seabed. Many countries ban dredging during spawning seasons because of this. In some cases, there have been reports of dredging increasing populations of oysters, mussels, and crabs. Um, it's possible that they benefit from the seabed being agitated, or maybe it does help dislodge any sort of egg or sperm that did settle. Oxygen can decrease because waste is released. Anything that's settled at the bottom of the seabed that sank, whether it's, um, you know, fecal material or dead organisms, that can be dislodged again and then put back into the water column. Um, the oxygen is going to be decreased because of eutrophication. So again, eutrophication right here. Bacteria decomposing algae or decomposing producers or decomposing fecal material, whatever. But the algae is um, using up, not the algae, the bacteria is using up oxygen to break down any of the waste material that's released. Um, oxygen can decrease when excess waste is removed. Therefore, you have a really slow rate of decay. All right, and then chemical releases from sediment. So, um, you know, heavy metals are heavy and they're gonna sink because they have density. And so, um, tributylene, TBT, um, oils that have now coagulated and sunk to the bottom, um, PCBs, heavy metals like copper, lead, mercury, those can get dislodged from the sediment um, and they are released during dredging. They can bioaccumulate in organisms and magnify up your higher trophic levels. Bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Accumulation is when an organism cannot excrete out a substance and it accumulates in their tissues. Biomagnification is the building of those toxins up your trophic levels as your higher order organisms consume more food. In the Puget Sound, the blubber from orcas were tested for toxins and there was so much of it and there's a lot of blubber. They referred to it as the most polluted animal on the planet. So you can see from the Puget Sound, um, you have PCBs being released in the atmosphere. It gets leached and then put into your water. Phytoplankton absorb it. So there's a small amount in your phytoplankton. Zooplankton take it up, so now they have a little bit more. Fish that eat zooplankton now have those toxins built up inside of them. Same thing with your salmon, and then salmon are being consumed by the orca. Mercury accumulation. Mercury is dumped into seawater, can um, turn into methyl mercury. It's really toxic to animals. It accumulates in phytoplankton. It'll stay in the liver and fatty tissues of different consumers. Methyl mercury is a neurotoxin. It can cause tremors, convulsions, and seizures. Young children and pregnant nursing women are told only to eat some of these predatory fish because they will um, build up in your, um, in your body, in your fat cells. Mercury enters the ocean by 30% from human industry, coal, oil burning, and gold mining, 60% from um, floods on land and forest fires, 10% from volcanoes and rock leaching. 
Mercury release has been regulated since the 1970s. All right, and mercury can cause Minamata disease. Tributylin or TBTs? Um, let me, hold on one second. We're just gonna pause this real quick. Okay, tributylin. Um, biofouling, and we meant, I talked about this in a couple of classes today. When organisms like seaweeds, barnacles, mollusks, sponges, um, tube worms will attach to the hulls of ship or the bottoms of a ship, this will um, add drag onto the boat and they'll have to use more fuel. Uh, if they're using more fuel, they're releasing more carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. So they're going to contribute to acid rain and global warming more so. And, um, and it is not cost effective to have organisms hanging on the outside of your boat. TBT or tributylin was added to anti-fouling paints. If you're a fowler, you're um, like hanging and like hitchhiking on the boat. So just growing on the outside. So TBT was added to anti-fouling paints for the hulls of ships so that organisms won't attach themselves to it. Um, it's effective in, in that, right? But it does leak into the water. Um, it will get stuck into the seabed and it'll sink there and it could stay there for about 30 years, the tributylin. Uh, it's really toxic, even at really low concentrations. It not only affects targeted species, but obviously it's going to be a heavy metal. It's going to build up in your food web and um, have an influence on non-targeted species as well and accumulate in their tissues. Um, so how it can affect them? It'll alter invertebrate development, cause deformities in oysters, um, and masculinization in dog whelks. Therefore, you're going to have fewer um, fertile females because you're going to have more organisms turning males. So it does affect their hormone responses. This is um, this could be answered. These could help answer number six on your chapter 13 study guide. <coughs> <coughs> Tributylene could reduce the immune response. So in tuna, sea otters, dolphins, um, their liver is compromised and they're because their liver is probably working super hard to try and get uh, this heavy toxin out of their body, but they're not going to be able to. Um, it'll stop their ability to fight. Gosh, I really think the talking causes the yawning, but it'll it'll decrease their ability to fight off infection um, and decrease their overall immune response if their body is busy trying to filter out another toxin. Organizations have been formed and many treaties have been signed to ban TBT and anti-fouling paints. Um, however, making sure people don't use this is not easy. Global warming and human activity. Um, combustion of fossil fuels will increase atmospheric carbon dioxide and it could increase the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect is just the, the um, increased absorption of infrared radiation from the sun. And this is uh, caused by certain gases in our atmosphere trapping in that, in that heat. This causes um, global climate anomalies, global climate changes. So this is the heating of the atmosphere due to the presence of CO2 and other gases. It prevents infrared radiation from being readmitted to space. And so it, it ends up acting like a blanket because it gets absorbed. These greenhouse gases will reflect and trap in infrared energy. And infrared is like the heat, like you can see heat waves. Um, it's also like the, the hotness of the sun that you feel. The greenhouse effect is a natural phenomenon, and it's not solely caused by human activities, but we do exasperate it at our rate of fossil fuel combustion. Um, our rate and just immense mass of commercial agricultural farming and release of methane. The greenhouse gases that are prevalent in our atmosphere are carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, which have been banned, and um, nitrous oxides. Increasing of human population and combustion have definitely increased the production of these gases and it's caused an imbalance into our carbon cycle. And we see that too because our oceans are getting more acidic. Um, too much CO2 is being released and we're not releasing it out. Uh, another downside to this. Um, we'll talk about that on this slide. So the evidence for global warming, definitely know these. Uh, this was towards the back of your study guide 
Um, number 29 would help this. The productivity in a marine ecosystem is affected by global warming. Um, 28, discuss and evaluate evidence that global warming is occurring and that human activity is contributing to this process. Okay, so this is um, evidence for global warming, know them. This is evidence that shows that greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has increased and the average global temperature has also increased. So um, increasing the global temperature. NOAA, NASA, uh, United Kingdom, Japan, we all monitor global temperature and we all have a baseline average for various locations. So we have like international um, comparisons together. Overall, the average global temperature has increased. Your temperature anomaly graph. You can see there's NASA, the Goddard Institute. Um, that's in Cleveland, actually. Oh. Um, you have the Met Office, um, NOAA, its Met Office is in England, and then um, Japanese Meteorology Agency. So we are, you know, pretty much all reporting about the same thing. It's just, you know, a tenth of a degree anomaly, honestly. But you can see these fluctuations. Um, increased levels of atmospheric CO2. So again, one of them, one of those is the increase in temperature. Um, increased levels of atmospheric CO2. Atmospheric CO2 is monitored by observatories on Ma Mauna Loa, Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Um, the overall trend will show that the average seasonal increase and decrease is due to um, changing rates in photosynthesis. Um, however, we can use ice cores um, to measure the atmospheric CO2 from past years. So the, the bullet above, we will have seasonal highs and lows in carbon dioxide based on how much sun is shining, and that's going to influence, um, you know, photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide gets taken in in photosynthesis, and it's when photo is low, you're going to have higher amounts of CO2. So ice cores are also used to measure atmospheric um, CO2 in the past years. The oldest core was 800,000 years old. Um, it's hard to get much further than that because of the half-life of carbon dioxide, or half-life of carbon. CO2 gets trapped in the frozen ice um, as tiny little gas bubbles, and their composition gets studied for age and for temperature. You can see it here on the Mauna Loa Observatory. It's increased over time. Okay, the melting of sea ice and sea level rise. Satellite imagery can show that the amount of sea ice in the water and land is decreasing each year. Oh, I don't have a picture for that. That's a bummer. Um, the Antarctic ice sheet has lost 134 billion tons of ice per year since 2002. The Greenland ice sheet has lost 287 billion tons of ice. Um, melting will increase the average sea level because it's adding water to the um, it's adding water to your ocean basins. In the last century, the sea level rose about 17 centimeters. Um, our current rate is nearly double that, though, the speed at which we are increasing our sea level. Um, that sucks, though, because if we remember the albedo effect, um, the albedo effect, I don't know if I... I don't know if you can see this. Maybe you can. If you can, I will up. Think albedo, think like albino. Okay. So we know that the color black will absorb colors, or it does not absorb colors, it'll absorb sunlight. Um, the color white will reflect off sunlight. So the more ice and the more snow that we have, when the sun shines, it gets reflected back into space. It's not absorbed because it's the color white. It reflects back all light. Well, as the um, planet gets warmer, we're going to start to lose the ice. We're going to start to lose some of the snow covers. So we're losing this color white. It's going to now reveal um, soil or just darker area compared to the whiteness of a glacier or of snow. And that is going to cause more of the sun to be absorbed. If more sun is being absorbed, then that temperature in that area is going to start to increase, which will then cause more ice to melt. If more ice is melting, then we have even more soil and dark surface exposed, 
which causes more sun absorption, which causes more heat, which causes more ice loss. So the albedo effect is this reflecting of sunlight off this um, like white or like frozen ice surface. And if we're melting ice, we're just causing this to be absorbed even more because we are removing this white cover on there. Okay, and then um, the last evidence for global warming is climate change. So uh, the changes in the seasons, the winters in the Northern hemisphere are ending earlier and the volume, I know it doesn't always feel like that people who are living there though. Um, the volume of snow is decreasing. Um, yeah, I have plenty of friends that will tell you otherwise. It's really cold and snowy still. The ranges of some organisms are changing. Um, the barracuda and the Pacific cod are being found more north because um, they can tolerate, um, the, you know, in the north, it's getting a little bit warmer, so they can migrate a little bit further. Um, more extreme weather events. We have really strong storms, um, really heavy flooding. Animals are leaving hibernation earlier, like flowers will be blooming sooner. The mountain pine beetle eats pine trees. It's normally killed off in cold winters, but they're spreading further northwards as the winter will start to become warmer. Sea ice. Alternative theories for um, global warming. Several problems about the evidence. So this, uh, I, don't, I think there might be a question about... Uh, I feel like I saw a question about global warming and um, to refute it, reasons why you would refute it. Some people, number 17, some people do not agree that human activities have influence on global warming. Describe two examples of evidence that would support this view. So here are your two, three, and four. Carbon dioxide levels and temperature do correlate, but it's hard to tell which one is causing the other. So for example, um, if the planet is warming, then CO2 inside the ocean, the, its ability to dissolve inside the ocean will decrease because of kinetic energy, um, you know, pushing the gas out of solution and particle movement. The gas particles, gas particles will get pushed out, the CO2 will get pushed out. So therefore, carbon dioxide will have to be pushed back into the atmosphere from the ocean, thus increasing atmospheric CO2. And so if the above scenario um, is correct, then they're saying temperature it, um, the earth getting warmer or warm oceans is what's causing more CO2 to be put into the atmosphere just because it's getting pushed out of solution. Um, ice core data. It shows that the planet goes through natural heating and cooling cycles and the same for carbon dioxide cycles. So perhaps we're just in a warming cycle. You got a link there. Several problems about the evidence again. Um, recent temperature measurements have conflicted with current models of global warming, suggesting that the speed that temperature is increasing is slowed down. So yeah, it's gotten warmer, but it's not getting as warm as fast as what it used to. Global temperatures can correlate with solar activity rather than carbon dioxide amounts. So sunspot activity and global warming have also correlated together. But the comparisons between solar energy um, that actually reach our planet does not correlate with the temperature change. So solar flares, solar activity, that has increased over time. Um, however, that is not affecting our planet. Fun fact, a female olive or sea turtle can store sperm inside her and use it during a mating season. Consequences of global warming, again, know this. I'm saying know this because I've gone through the test questions. Um, melting of sea ice. So satellite images will show that the Arctic sea ice and land sheets of Antarctica and Greenland are retreating as well. Is there a picture for that? Negative. Um, consequences of melting of sea ice, we're gonna have increased sea level, which, you know, you know, living in Florida, we're really close to sea level already. Like we really can't afford to take on more water. Um, flooding, coastal erosion, loss of human and animal communities. Um, soils will become really saline. It will obviously affect agriculture then. Lower level, at, lower level atolls could also disappear. Their atolls um, are sinking barrier reefs. 
Um, subsidence, subsidence, that was the sinking word. Um, melting of ice sheets will decrease in salinity because we're adding fresh water to the ocean. This could harm osmoconformers who conform to their um, environment. They can only tolerate narrow ranges of salinities. Um, this could affect their breeding. This could dr dramatically affect currents and global pycnoclines, which is density gradients, or halo-clines, which is salt gradients. We could lose habitats. We know the polar bears um, are losing their habitats. Same with walrus and seals. Any organism that lives on sea ice will lose its habitats. Um, and then we have the acidification of water. CO2 is an acidic as gas that's going to dissolve in seawater. Um, it creates carbonic acid. If CO2 is starting to increase, then ocean acidity will increase. This will hurt corals. This will hurt mollusks. This will hurt sea urchins. Any shelled organism that has calcium carbonate in it. More consequences of global warming. Um, increasing water temperature could cause coral bleaching because remember your, your zooxanthellae, the symbiotic relationship they have with algae, the zooxanthellae have to have a very narrow temperature, narrow salinity. Um, everything needs to be pretty perfect for them. So if we increase the water temperature, it could get too warm and the corals will eject the zooxanthellae. Changes in the ranges of organisms if seawater starts to increase. Organisms will have to leave their area when the water gets too warm, and then they have to go to a new area that's within their temperature range. They're gonna encounter competition with them. Um, they could outcompete the native species, disrupting those trophic levels in food chains, um, or they could get killed. Krill is um, really heavy in many ocean food chains, and they reproduce at really slow rates in warmer water. So if it does get warmer, that's one organism that would be affected. Um, their rate of reproduction would go down for the krill. Phytoplankton productivity, um, photosynthesis increases at higher temperatures, and um, this could actually be counterbalanced by acidity and salinity. So if not only the temperature is getting warmer, but we're also increasing the salinity of the water because of evaporation, um, we could be increasing the acidity of the water because of carbon dioxide being dissolved in it. Um, harmful algal blooms could release toxins. Um, this could cause anoxic areas of the ocean where they start to decay, like the brevitoxin. Animal physiology. So other than um, birds and mammals, there are other organisms in the sea are cold-blooded. So the warmer the water, the higher their respiration rate to try and, um, to try and maintain their, their preferred temperature. So they're going to need more food, and they're also going to need more oxygen in order to maintain that temperature. We could have changes in breeding seasons. So among other things, temperatures heavily regulates breeding times. Um, you saw that with, uh, I believe, your grouper, right? 27 to 28 degrees Celsius is their range a week before or after new moon. Offspring can mature at the wrong time um, because it's too warm. They might mature too fast. The migrations might be timed, and they plan to leave a location when the food sources are high. but it's actually flawed because it's not really that time of the year they should be leaving. It just feels that way because of the temperature. Changes in ocean currents. Um, currents are a product of differences of density of water. And density is controlled by the amount of particles you have and the temperature of the water. So temperature and salinity will determine density. And if temperature is changing, then we could alter oceanic currents. Um, last consequence of global warming is going to be climate change. The last 20 years, we've seen an increase in um, really strong weather episodes. You know, it's always, oh, this is the strongest hurricane to hit the, you know, southeast coast. Um, strongest seasons of tornadoes. Um, really strong wildfires with because of droughts. Really strong flooding because you have rain for weeks. <laughs> Um, so these strong weather episodes could damage reefs and coastal areas. They could stir up sediment. Um, that sediment could decrease photosynthesis. It could smother organisms, their gills or coral polyps. Estuaries will have more flooding at high tide and be kind of less of a barrier for us. The storms could bring off a lot of nutrients that could cause algal blooms and eutrophication. And our last slide. So using wrecked ships for dive sites. Um, Three million shipwrecks are on our ocean floor. When they sink, it will initially disrupt the seabed of where it lands. One second. Um, within weeks, it'll start to undergo succession, where succession is the change in your communities over a period of time. Um, when sinking, you'll need to drain the oil 
um, and any pieces that have anti-fouling paint to move electrical equipment and batteries. Sinking a clean ship could definitely increase biodiversity, but accidental sinking of a full ship will cause numerous threats. Um, wreck diving improves ecotourism and local economies, but careless divers could damage the reef. They could steal corals as souvenirs. Um, many boats could cause pollution. Many ships are sunk as remembrance sites from war graves. They're not um, a tourist attractions and can be treated with respect. Some ships are archaeological relics and need to be protected to prevent flooding. I'm sorry, to prevent looting. Obviously, they're underwater. And then as fish hang out over the wreck, fishermen will trawl over it to try and steal them. And this could also affect those wreck sites. I'm just going to really quick read number eight, the pros and cons. I'm sorry, the comparing and contrasting ecological impacts um, of a wreck of an oil fill tanker compared with a vessel that was deliberately sunk. So um, they both will increase biodiversity. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to read. Okay. The one that was sunk on accident will damage the sea floor, um, could damage corals, could damage the seabed. The tanker will leak heavy metals, like toxins, into the, um, into the environment. These toxins can accumulate in food chains. You could reference specifically um, tributylin or TBT for short in anti-fouling paints. Um, the tanker, the oil tanker that was sunk could cause less habitats instead of like it promoting habitats. It will eventually, after years, promote a habitat, but not initially. Um, the oil tanker that sunk on accident could obviously release oil, which could damage feather and fur. The oil could cause gill damage. The oil could decrease light penetration. Therefore, the oil could decrease photosynthesis and coral productivity. Shipwrecks are negative for tourism because they're unsightly. Um, however, if we are deliberately sinking them, they could place a positive value on ecotourism because they will become like an artificial reef. Um, it could also place a positive value on species conservation. Both of those ships will provide substrates um, and a habitat for growth. It may just take a longer time for your one that sunk on accident. Um, they will create more niches and therefore allow more food chains because more organisms will live there and it will increase biodiversity. The um, Specifically, the vessel that was deliberately sunk will increase biodiversity right away. The tanker, the oil tanker that sunk on accident will not increase biodiversity immediately. It'll actually decrease biodiversity initially. Okay. That's all. Goodbye.